Welcome everybody to episode 23 of Interview with the Old Mage with Matt Forbeck. This is our final installment with our interview with Matt, and I really do hope you enjoy it. And here is Matt Forbeck. So, so other than Minecraft, what's in the future for Matt Forbeck? Oh, let's see. Uh, stuff I probably can't talk about. Uh, <laughs> NDAs, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, well, I got the, I, the shotguns and sorcery property has reverted to me as well, so uh, I had placed it out to somebody else for a role-playing game. Uh, they were very late on it. The license expired. They're moving on to other things. So I'm going to be releasing that sometime in the next year as well, uh, maybe in the next few months. Uh, there's an omnibus for that coming out. Brave New World, we're going to do a Kickstarter for. Uh, I actually am working on uh, two different tabletop games, too. I got one coming out uh, from Calliope. They did something called the uh, Titans of Gaming as a Kickstarter a few years ago. Where they had, like, the top 12 game designers in the world. And I'm, uh, apparently I was a stretch goal for this. And I, uh, I, they had to be. <laughs> and uh, I have a game coming out from them sometime, hopefully by the end of the year. We're working on doing revisions of that right now. And there's another one there's going to be a Kickstarter for working on some role-playing game stuff. Uh, the novel I was supposed to have done for tour eight years ago, I'm still working on. And all the other things are lining up behind that. And then, of course, the things that will show up in my inbox next week that I have no idea about at the moment. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one things for you, future. Matt. It, it, there you go. Now, so, it's strange. Seriously, I'll be sitting there. All, I'm like, God, I, I'm getting a little slow here. And then, boom, suddenly yep. it just drops yep. in your lap. And like, hmm, nice. Okay, good. <laughs> good right, problem Kurt, to have. What would you have, Curry? Matt? Tell me, uh, other than your experience with Halo, uh, what other games are longtime favorites, or are you currently playing now? Oh, that's a good question. Um, see, I, I just finished playing The Outer Worlds, which was designed by... Oh, my I did Kate that Williams, too! Yes! Right? I loved it. And I'm actually starting to play The Outer Wilds right now, which is this really interesting game. It's uh, I, I'd spoil it for you if I told you too much about it, but it's a really... Check it out. It's a very intriguing game. Uh, more about space exploration and physics and, and some really wild story possibilities. I've played this crap out of the last Assassin's, two Assassin's Creed games, mostly okay. because I was a story doctor on Origins, and then when Odyssey came out, I'm like, I'm playing the hell out of it. <laughs> uh, uh, my son got me started playing Death Stranding the other day, uh, but then he oh he took the PS4 with him to college. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I watched uh, Patrick Rothfuss was live streaming uh, yeah. playing it the other day, and I was talking with him about it because we were talking about how it tied into Tides of Numenara, which yep. he had worked on writing, which, of course, is part of the premier game that came out for the Cypher system, which exactly. you're going to be doing Shotguns and Sorcery through. Shotguns and Sorcery is a Cypher system. It's all it's a very incestuous industry because, you know, that's Monty Cook's game, right? Monty yeah. was the guy who edited my first solo book that I ever wrote way back in the day. It was Western Hero back when he was working for Iron Crown Enterprises before he moved over to TSR. That came out back in, like, 92, I think. So it's been a while, but you know, and these, these are just guys that you, you get to know them for decades at this point, right? It's kind of wild. Uh, I had I had stuff come out before that, but that was the first time I actually had my own solo book that had done everything on myself. Right. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just wild the number uh, different people you get to work with over the years, and wild projects. But but I am a big video game player. I play whatever I can get my hands on. You need to finish off Life is Strange too at the moment, and, but you know I'll go in streaks too. Like I'll play a video game like every day for a month. And I'll say, oh, I'm done. Now I'm reading for a month, right? Nice. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, I'll move on to doing books. Or I'll, like I just got back into reading comic books again because I, I never stop entirely, but I write like the Marvel Encyclopedia or the Captain America book, and I'm stuffing my brain full of comic books. And like I don't read another comic for a year after <laughs> comic book, right? Because uh, your brain just says, nope, forget it. You've had plenty. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, there are other things like video games and, and novels and whatever else I can move more around. So, so, yeah, it's just fun to wander through and, uh, and check out different things and see what people are working on. It's, uh, you know, I'm fortunate enough to have a lot of friends who are doing creative work. So I get to sample a lot of different things even before they're out. Um, and then uh, yeah, if I'm lucky, I get to work on some people with these things. So I did a bunch of writing in a video game coming out called Biomutant, for instance. That'll be out, I think, later oh, this nice. year. Here's the theory. Okay. But that's why I spent a good chunk of my, uh, my fall doing. So I, I don't think they announced officially that I was involved with it, but my employer kept tweeting at me about it, so I assume he's okay with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to do the work on Assassin's Creed Origins, because as, as a fan of that series for a long time, I really appreciated the return to a coherent narrative. I thought it was neat, right? Yeah. Like, like my job with coming in there was I, I would say, 
I read all this stuff and say, I don't get this, this, and this. They're like, well, it's explained in the side mission. I'm like, well, you need to make that a main mission because otherwise <laughs> who the hell's going to know what you're talking about? And, you just, well, and helping and, you rearrange stuff like that. And there's the line for the resume, designer of coherent narratives. <laughs> yeah, there you right? go. <laughs> sure. Well, in like the Assassin's Creed series, it suffered from that for a long time where it started to be like you had all these different components which on their own were cool. Like in Assassin's Creed 3, you're participating in the American Revolution. But then... Everything you're doing is always like every cutscene was always taking place. Like you're in the room next to where they're discussing the Declaration of Independence <laughs> or something, and you'd have maybe a flash of a date, and there was no real sense of like, what the hell am I doing? And the early part of that game series, you had a coherent narrative. It felt like you were part of something big, and it was going somewhere. And then it just went <laughs> for <laughs> close to ten years before Assassin's Creed Origins really brought it back to like. We're going to follow a character, and we're going to have a strong narrative, and it's actually going to be related to the main storyline of the games. And and you felt for your last of the Magi and his losing his son, and especially the relationship between him and his wife, and how it's not that there's this big betrayal or anything like that. They just go through trauma, and then they grow apart, because yep. they went through this incredibly traumatic thing that dr transformed both of them, and the relationship just fades away and it's not like, oh, you cheated on whoever or you get oh, yeah, killed yeah. or anything like that. Like, no, they just, you know, and also seeing how that passion, you know, there was a choice that had to be made. Like, do I pursue the passion or do I try and just have a life? I think Ubisoft is doing some of the greatest narratives and games these days just doing that kind of stuff. And uh, I got involved with them through a guy named Rich Dansky, who uh, was the Wraith developer for White Wolf for many years and then moved to North Carolina and became the head Clancy writer. And he's been the head Clancy writer for like 20 years now. He's wow. probably more Clancy words than Clancy ever wrote. Oh, wow. Uh, by, by an order of magnitude, probably, at this point. So, But yeah, he's a neat guy. And, uh, he actually introduced me to a bunch of people at uh, Ubisoft over the years, which is how I ended up working with them. Um, but again, it's a lot of times it's who you know, and people say, well, I know this guy, he does good work, but I trust him. And if you can do those three things with anybody, you're head and shoulders above everybody else walking in the door. Because mm -hmm. part of it's not just being somebody who is talented, but if you're working in a large group like that, like you do with video games, you also have to make sure that you're not a prima donna asshole. <laughs> yeah, <That's>, right. <laughs> uh, because it's all work for hire, and they want to know that they're going to be able to get the words out of you that they need and not have to fight with you, right? Ideally, these are short-term gigs, so if it turns out that you hate each other, you can walk away. And so every now and then, they call you back, which is always even more fun. <laughs> and, you know, it's, as a freelancer, the thing about video games is a lot of times they didn't think they needed writers for decades. Oh, right? yeah. It's only been, like, the last 10 years or so that they've really decided that they should have writers involved at the ground floor. It used to be you'd get called at the end, they'd say, hey, we have this great thing we came up with, and now we need somebody to take the pieces of our Frankenstein monster and stitch them together as well as you can. And yeah. Try I've done that. Start. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you didn't have the technology to, like, have the game kind of carry a narrative on its own, but now you look at any game, you've got nearly put realistic graphics. You can see what's happening. Yeah. You're like, there's a story there. I need to know where it is, where if you're playing the old gauntlet on an Atari you know, and you're going through like an 8-bit or 4-bit dungeon there, you know, you only know something's an orc because the instruction manual told you, like, oh, it's yeah. an orc or something like that. But, but yeah, you see how story is something that they left out of games for a long time as they moved to uh, uh, going to the massively multiplayer games. And I know the Mass Effect series, that bit them in the ass at the uh, <laughs> the end of that. Uh, see, that, was a, that was a series that relied on story to sell itself, right? Right. And uh, they just... They, uh, they had a lack of faith at the end of it that, that kind of torpedoed them. Like yeah, say, well, they, they showed, I mean, if you watch the production videos for that, uh, after the initial release date was, like, the game was supposed to be released, they delayed it for three months, and they're having, you're seeing the first brainstorming notes for what the ending of the game is. And they've been marketing the whole thing, saying, like, we're not going to give you a bespoke A, B, or C ending. It was supposed to be that RPG that we'd always wanted, where it really was going to give you the custom end based off of all the decisions that you made. And then it got down to it, and it was a color-coded A, B, or C ending. Like, I, I filed the FTC complaint against, F, uh, against EA over that. <laughs> That was, yeah, I got so, I got death threats for doing that, too. Because, like, oh, why can't you be mature and just review bomb the game and harass the, the creators? It's like, well, like, <laughs> it, got, it got so wrongly panned that they came out with DLC to fix it, right? Right, yeah. And you're like, oh, that's pretty amazing. Um, it, it, that was just a horrible misstep, right? And it happens. Every, you know, 
But I think they were just not having faith in their own plan and what they had promised people at that point. And honestly, one of the reasons that video game endings suck is because most people don't get to them, right? Most yeah. people play a game, only get play, play like the first five or ten hours and then wander off and do something else. So, if, and especially if you have branching endings, let's say you have branching endings, and that means that uh, maximum, even if everybody got to the ending, you're only going to probably see one of three endings, right? So how do you budget for that? Where's your money going, right? If mm -hmm. you have one ending, you can make a spectacular mm -hmm. goddamn ending because you're putting all your money into that budget. But if you have three different endings, and then if you realize that maybe only 20% of the people are going to get to the end, and so you're really only getting a third of 20% they are going to be able to see that, and are you really going to put all your money into this spectacular ending? So it really does become this budgetary issue. And uh, if you're pinching pennies toward the end of game development, when it gets to crunch time, you start thinking, where can we cut? And you go, well, remember those endings we promised people that nobody's really going to watch anyway? It seems like that's right. a safe place to cut, right? Even though it bit them in the ass because that was one of the, of the things that they had promised people in that franchise was that the, what your actions were going to be would matter. And, uh, and they blew it. Because, uh, now, the Telltale games, on the other hand, the Walking Dead games, they did for that. Were, oh, my God. For that. Those were, they, were amazing. Yeah, because it, it made you feel like everything mattered. Now, the funny part was that nothing actually mattered. No matter what you did in that oh, game, yeah. what, no matter what you did in the game, it's like, will you save the kid or not save the kid? The kid's dead either way in five minutes from that point, right? Because, again, the budget says that they can't do two huge branches. They have to come back together. So, you know, if, you, if there's a chance for this kid to actually die, even if you save him, five minutes later, he's going to disappear somehow and be out of the plot, right? Because they won't have the, the money to actually yeah. do two separate branches. Um, it, but at the end of this game, they still made you feel like every one of those choices made a difference because it meant something emotionally to you, personally, whether or not it meant something to the branching plot. And that was a bit of genius in their part. Uh, right. Uh, I, I learned a lot playing those games, like the, the, the Walking Dead games in particular, uh, and playing through as the little girl Clem in those games. Like, that was... It, it was an amazing set of storytelling games, and as a DM, I was like, "Wow, how do I bring this into my session? How do I how do I create those experiences that give my players that connection?" And you know, and and, and it brings it back to that: how do you bring in that human aspect to these superhuman events that are taking place, and give those those moments that make the players feel like they're in there, whether it's you know through descriptions or something as simple as turning out the lights when it's dark for a scene. Yeah, or uh, I don't think you were here earlier for Matt, but my my wife came walking in at the beginning of, of this with a little <laughs> bottle of fake blood that I keep in my DMing kit, and she's just like cleaning all the like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, what is fake, this? fake like, blood. He keeps saying ah, fake blood. blood. Yeah, are, are you gonna eat it? Well, I, maybe. <laughs> you you <laughs> insincere person! You're supposed to bleed real blood as a dungeon master. Oh, don't don't even! I will. I have thought about that. I like. I lit. I I lit my. I've lit myself on fire now twice. For <laughs> seconds in the past few weeks, uh, using a mix of alcohol and sodium and water. But I I lit my arms on fire for the scenes with a uh, I. All of the orc players in my game recently had encounters with Grumsh in the orc pantheon, and so they were having they were chosen to gift Grumsh with their sight during these trying times. Since, of course, he only has the one eye because his you know asshole brother Coralon carved it out. Uh, <laughs> well, we my eye, sir. A lot of alcohol. So. <laughs> I have to but, say, I've been playing for 35 years. I've never set myself on fire once. <laughs> uh, Spike, you yep. have to remove clothing for this, but <laughs> you put naphtha on your palm and light it, and the fumes will burn and not burn you. There right. you go. Right, exactly. Yeah, bare, bare flesh was key for all of that. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, I, I did a lot of research <laughs> into this, but turned out the lights. I had red LEDs that I turned on by remote, queued up Ofotuna from Carmina Barana. Because, uh, of course. Person. Like, <laughs> yeah. And then I lit my arm on fire and, it, like, pretended to, like, slip my palms open while fake blood slid down it. It was <laughs> everything I've ever wanted as a DM. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Just keep you don't, you're not, tr you're not truly a DM until you actually slit your wrists, okay? <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> I, I might play it for so bad, but they're not bad. Children listening <laughs> at that. home should know more. <laughs> well, but yeah, it's all about creating that that the moment of immersion no, and how how do you get people to 
how do you create something that makes somebody feel something with the tools that you have to reach them with? You know, with a book, it's just your writing, really, and maybe some illustrations. Uh, you know, for me, I love gaming because you do have all those different ways that you can do it. And maybe you go a little too far and start emotionally manipulating your players outside of the game. But uh... <laughs> you know, you know, it's it, Curry can attest to this too. Back when his dad was alive, him and I were he was my roommate. And uh, we were playing a D&D session, and he had this huge stereo system. Yeah, and old $10,000 Sansui imported stereo system that just rocked the block. <laughs> so, so I got it ready before. I had this CD of thunderstorm sounds, and I keyed up a lightning strike, and I turned it up all the way. So the, and the stereo was behind them, and as soon as somebody, and I knew they would, <laughs> cast lightning bolt, all I did was just hit play. <laughs> you Many never diapers saw diapers were changed. <laughs> Many diapers were changed. You never saw kids scatter and scream. Oh my god! <laughs> they thought a real lightning bolt happened in the house. That was so loud, and it was just incredible. So I, I tend to use sound and stuff like that for for my games. I never, I've never used the fake blood and the you know and what. Yeah, well, and that's that's new for me. But I, I. I've been pushing myself because I always uh, I <laughs> criticize myself and I look at what I did like last session and it's like, man, I only got this many players to cry and uh, I don't know. This sounds, this sounds a whole lot like Dark Dungeons from Jack Chick. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I do. I, I I like to do a lot of big epic things. Like, uh, you know, I talked with Ed and Eric a bunch about this scene I had where Vecna came into the Forgotten Realms of my ca campaign world, and it was this big event. But what really drew it all together was that it was focused on the sacrifice of the party's cleric, this NBC that they all cared about, and who was also, they just discovered, was the sister of one of the other party members, but they, you know, more than stopping Tiamat and the Cult of the Dragon or anything else, they got drawn into it because uh, someone they knew was wrong, and it became something that was very personal, and I went out of my way to make all these, like, gut-wrenching recordings of the, like, events and the characters involved so that I could immerse them in this, but, uh, uh, it, you know, it, again, it was bringing those superhuman elements back to, to the very, very human things of, you know, relationship between two sisters and, and their mother who got involved in all this, too. But, uh, and then Lathander showed up, but it was, it was complicated. But it was, it, yeah. it, it really, it had, it had people in tears at the table. And it was, uh, and again, it wasn't because they were fighting this big bad villain or because Vecna showed up. It was because someone was attacking their sister, a member of the party. I, I like exploring that space, too, of, like, what can get my, what can make these really big superhuman things feel real to my players, you know? And it's like you're tying it. To, it's like tying a balloon to, or a, a kite to a key and trying to get it hit by lightning. Uh, <laughs> right, you, right, you know, right. You're, how do I create that connection? And you kind of are piggybacking that, like, well, okay, I'm going with this basic human emotion. I'm playing on, you know, sibling feelings or camaraderie in a party or just caring about a child or something like that. And how do I push that into suddenly caring about what a lich has been doing or you know or what you know the the after effects of tiamat's trying to come in into the forgotten realms you know what are the effects of that on ever on you know people they care about and everyday people and carrying that through so they care when they get to that final battle it's not just like okay let's let's kill this uh this boss uh actually matt one of my players is a 15 year old girl and uh you know, in a, and some of my guys are like in their 60s and started playing back in the 70s together. So we've got a mixed group. And she had her big moment confronting her father, a purple worm speaker or a worm speaker of the Cult of the Dragon, the green worm speaker, uh, uh, Naren Vane. One of the other characters had personal beat too and was involved. And so we're having this big interaction and it's getting dramatic. And then the team pops in and is like, I'm going to kill you, bitch. And it's just like finding that way to make it resonate for her. I realized, like, man, like I got it with the one player, but I wasn't able to reach her then. Right now, there it's the day before Tiamat is getting summoned, and now she's having a crisis of like emotion, like, oh, I want to go back to the Misty Forest and try and commune with my father's ghost. It's like, um, we're at Doomsday in like <laughs> eighteen hours. Can this like? It's a mid-TMAT crisis. <laughs> That's right. Right, 
Right, it is. But yeah, yeah, you know, but at the same time, like it's something that yeah, and luckily our group's very patient and we're we're realizing it, but it's like it's yeah, finding what grabbed her and finding what can reach her is very different than with some of my adult players who learn to be more emotionally open. And uh, do, do you have any tricks for that? Like, how do you, how do you reach those younger audiences, or what makes it feel more re- makes it resonate more for them? Mostly, I'm just worried about my children beating the shit out of each other at the tables. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I was talking more about your your books, but very <laughs> job oh, playing games. So, I mean, we actually had uh, my kids start out early playing all sorts of different board games, but uh, John Kavalik's a buddy of mine, right? So we're out there actually doing a, a political protest march against Scott Walker back in 2011, I think, something like that. And uh, John's got an office right in the square. So he comes out and gives him a copy of Super Munch. And, wow. Oh, great. We're going to go home and play this. And I'm like, okay, great. You're like, you know, nine, ten years old. We're going to go home and play Super Munch. And they're like, oh, my God, they were not ready to stab each other in the back. <laughs> everything was like the worst most personal thing in the world uh and i'm like okay we're gonna play co-op games from now on yeah now eventually we got to the point where uh like i think for like the last six, last six years running andrew hackard who's the munchkins are over steve jackson games has invited us out so we play every sunday at noon we play munchkin with andrew at the steve jackson booth over at gen con and we just have a great goddamn time right but, you know, for us, a lot of times, it's just keeping on task, right? <laughs> <laughs> as far as reaching younger readers, I, again, it's just a matter of uh, writing something that's emotionally resonant to people. Um, the problems that younger people have are often different than the problems that older people have. Now, the neat thing about writing for problems that younger people have is that older people remember those problems, even if they don't actually have those exact same problems at the moment. So that's one of the reasons that a lot of times these epic hero stories start with, you know, the young farm boy or the kid who's going out to school or whatever, because even if you're not that age, you remember that age. Those are often fairly traumatic and uh, intriguing times for you that you're going to recall. So it's it's a great way to be able to, to tap into that. You know, if you're writing about a midlife crisis and how your wife is cheating on you, you know, probably the 13-year-old is not going to get into that as much just because of that. So, But if you're writing about, oh, my God, somebody's attacking my friends or or some, you know, my parents are, are disappeared, and now I have to be on my own. That's something, you know, for the first time. So that's something that a kid can mm-hmm. get into, right? Whether or not it's uh, ever happened to them or not, it might be a fear of yours that you can play on, or something they worry about. So that's that's generally where all goes. Stuff that's common to all ages, as opposed to something that's bracketed off. You know, fear of uh, of having to take care of of your parents as they pass in older years. That's something that, you know, a child is not going to worry about when they're 16, right? But when you're in your 40s and 50s, suddenly this becomes more of a big deal and becomes much more emotional resonant. So you can bracket things off to where uh, where your audience, wherever they happen to be, might be more concerned. My kids are not going to care about whether or not the retirement fund is going to be rated at some point. Right. Quick question, (laughs) Matt. We need to ask you before we don't have a chance because that's going to kill us all. Uh, Would you like to come back... And continue this conversation. I'm always happy to talk to you guys. That'd be, that'd be my pleasure. Great. This has well, been uh, a wealth of uh, great personality, great game design discussion, and books and supplements. <laughs> this has been such a varied conversation, and, I, and I've particularly loved it. Uh, guys, we do have to let Ed uh, go take care. Of, and I think uh, Eric has to life. go as well. And too, I know so. that Eric's probably snoring right now. Probably. I know. <laughs> I'm still awake. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's uh, put a pin in this, uh, do a plan B, uh, and reschedule for another episode. We've got a lot to edit and a lot of things to uh, work into the show. Um, Jeff will edit uh, all this stuff and then post something just as soon as it's available. A lot of this, what I'm cool. saying now, will probably get cut out. But one of the things I'd like to do is uh, as a live creatives um, next time we're all together. And the reason why is I think this particular group of game design discussion could really uh, lend to something fun. So the next time we get together, uh, put this together uh, as part of uh, our plan in your imagination. I'd like for us to live create a magical item. Ah, cool. Sounds like we, fun. We can all throw in. 
Yeah, the back of course you do. Of doom. <laughs> now we all know is blood, thunder, and fire. So no, it's it, 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 <laughs> somewhere, we'll it's somewhere in there, George. The no, it's somewhere we'll in there. George the has to be stinky, though. George has to be stinky yeah. somewhere. <laughs> Rod of Georgeness, for sure. But we'll take sure all the stats that we come up with, and we'll post it to the fan site and uh, on the YouTube page. And uh, you know, of course, every word we breathe becomes canon, so it's real. It's That's right. right. We it's must right. use this power only for good. <laughs> for good. <laughs> oh, boy. That's <laughs> personal vault. He's got what? you know eight dozen different artifacts no one's ever heard about anyway. Like that's Larlock. That that's what I want to see. Larlock's vault. That's like the Vatican archives of the Forgotten Realms. There's so right. much just lost history and stuff in there. <laughs> Well, let's, let's keep that for a discussion for next time, because I know that Jitty's sure. probably e- eating the doorknob off the door behind us. So. <laughs> Great talking, everybody. Right, Talk guys, to you later. Well, well, wait, yeah. wait, but wait, before you go, uh, Matt, is there a way, and we can do this again next time, too, but uh, sure. for people to get a hold of you, to be able to get in touch, besides for, yeah, what's uh, your uh, oh, yeah. uh, where can they go to get you? obviously. I'm, I'm on Twitter at m Forbeck. I'm on Instagram at M. Forbeck. I'm on Facebook at Forbeck. You can email me at Matt at Forbeck.com. However you want to get old, it's easy. Great. All right. I sense a theme here. <laughs> All the good things about having an unusual name. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been it's been wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. I know I talked to you like uh, – 12 months ago to get on the <laughs> show and then uh, and I never got back with you I do apologize but thank you so much for being gracious to come on it's been wonderful to have you it's always have been a great, great time thanks Matt it, it really like go ahead and drop your uh, social medias for us and your yeah, uh, Twitch oh, channel as well God. do I have social media um, well, well your yeah, Twitch. Spike Murphy on on Facebook I'm Spike dot Murphy on well I'm Spike Murphy Rose on Facebook Spike dot Murphy on Instagram and uh, uh, the I work with the Twitch channels Quest and Chaos and uh, Total Party Chill. They're both local Bay Area streams that I DM to friends of mine and Great. I've started building terrain for them and stuff. And yeah, and we'll be showing up on camera more for them too. Everyone seemed to really love my like Orcus and Tiamat mega battle. So yes, we did. Yes, it's cool. wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you all again, Eric. Uh, thanks for joining us again. And Ed, always uh, feel better, keep getting stronger and and give Ginny a hug. Hope she feels she's she's doing all right. And Matt, thank you so much again. Like I said, and hopefully I'll get to my wife and us to get there and play one of your, uh, go to one of your seminars or play one of your games, one of your uh, build a quest games. It'd be fantastic. Sure. That'd thank you. So and, and and Spike, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for finally coming on. And oh yeah, and, I loved uh, it. This is fantastic. And thank you again, Curry. And thank you all for joining us for our one-year celebration. I didn't know it was going to be a one-year celebration until Curry mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you how much I pay attention here, right? <laughs> but, 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 Matt, thank you again so much. It's been wonderful. Anything. We'll set up a time for you to come back, and uh, we'll do this again. We'll create some magic items. Excellent. Thanks, all guys. Right, thank you. Thanks, guys. All right. All right good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. That completes our series with Matt Forbeck and the Old Mage. We do appreciate your patience in getting this out to you guys. Uh, next up is going to be Erin Evans, and we should have hers out uh, next week, the first part of hers. And we hope you enjoy that, and don't forget, keep playing in the realms. Good evening, Mr. and Mrs. Faroon and all the ships at sea. Dateline, Waterdeep. Flash! Today at the corner of Delzorn Street and Brondor's Way, Melvin the Myopic Magician squared off against Doodles the Deafened Druid in a spell battle of the Whistless. Although no entries were reported as no actual spells were cast, they did bring in a dwarf share of golden jewels as their spectacle was perceived as performance art by onlookers. Both were summarily arrested by the Watch for not having the proper permits to perform in the North Ward. This ten day in the High Forest, the mythical descendants of the Arivandyar held their annual beauty contest. To the surprise of no one in attendance, there was no clear winner as they were all absurdly beautiful and sheer vanity alone had the judges voting for themselves. And finally, out of the libraries of Candlekeep, the wizened old scribes came to the unfortunate conclusion that for millennia we have simply been mispronouncing the word mizzle. 
It was recently discovered that an overly boisterous spell slinger with a lisp, thought to be the original creator of the magic missile spell, was blowing the whole thing out of proportion and had been overly braggadocious of its uses and powers. Would you like to know more? Then simply tune in to each and every episode of the Mages and Sages podcast and subscribe to the channel. Bash the like button and be sure to bear down on the bell button to keep up to date, for the bell tolls for thee.